Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Well, I hope we're clapping, not for me, but we're eager to get into God's word today. But hey, let's start with this. This is an interesting study. An interesting study revealed that the average adult wakes up grumpy 300 times a year. Get that. 300 times a year. Who's grumpy here today? Do not point to the person next to you. But according to this study that we wake up with a good mood only 18% of the time. The point isn't to see if you're above average or below average with that study. It's this. It's what do you do when a wave of grumpiness hits you in the morning or a wave of anger hits you in the middle of the day or a wave of anxiety? Think about a boat a boat is controlled by the waves. But if the boat is anchored, the anchored allows the boat not to drift off course, even if it's hit by the waves. And so it is with our emotions that our emotions, if we don't take time to understand them and to address them, then we are controlled by our actions, our reactions, our interactions with people based on the waves of our emotions throughout the day. Therefore, we need to be anchored in wisdom as it relates to our emotions. Well, can I high point today? If you've been here with us this summer, you know that we're in a series entitled Summer of Wisdom. Are you growing in wisdom this summer? I hope that you're growing in wisdom this summer. And uh, we've been studying the book of Proverbs, looking at a variety of different topics. Of course, we realize that wisdom doesn't come from human advice or from personal opinion. Wisdom comes from God and God's word. So if you have a copy of God's word in front of you, whether it's physical or digital, you can open it up, turn to Proverbs chapter 14. The title of the message today is this, is that the wise show emotional strength. Now, when we're talking about emotional strength, it's not this. It's not showing no emotion at all. It's not being emotionally strong and never crying. That's not it. We know about Jesus in the Gospels. It says that Jesus wept. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so emotional strength is this is that we are anchored in wisdom about our emotions so that we are not controlled by the waves of our emotions. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're actually going to be looking at three different emotions. The emotion of anger, the emotion of anxiety, and the emotion of joy. All three of these emotions are referenced throughout God's word. So they're not just emotional issues, but they're spiritual issues as well. Of course, I'm a pastor. I'm not a mental health professional. This is a worship service. This isn't a therapy session or a counseling session. We're not really talking about mental health issues today. We're talking about emotional strength. And I believe this sincerely that God wants each person here in this room, in the balcony, online to experience emotional strength in your life. 
And so we're going to be looking at three actions for emotional strength. If you're ready to get into it, let's say jump. One, two, three. Here we go. So here's number one is emotional strength comes when I control my anger. Either you control your anger or what? Your anger controls you. All throughout the book of Proverbs, there are lots of Proverbs about anger. We're going to take time to look at two of them today. So let's start with Proverbs 14, 17. It says this, a man of quick temper acts foolishly. It's pretty straightforward. I don't need to explain it any more than that. That if you have a quick temper, you're going to do what? You're going to act foolishly. You're going to say things that you shouldn't say. You're going to do things that you shouldn't do. How many of you have experienced this proverb before in your life? It's been said that if you uh, don't get control of your anger, that it's going to reveal the worst in you. And so when in our anger, the worst in us comes out. So we need to control our anger. But if we're going to control our anger, first we need to understand our anger. The Bible talks about three different types of anger. Did you know this? Divine anger, righteous anger, and sinful anger. So let's look at those three. First, what is divine anger? Well, that's God's anger. Yes, God is a God of perfect love, perfect grace, perfect mercy, but God is also a God of perfect justice. There are hundreds of references throughout the scripture about God's anger. God's anger is always about sin and disobedience. So that's divine anger. What is sin? What is righteous anger? Righteous anger is human anger that reflects God's anger, that it's anger about sin, that it's anger for the right reasons, but it's not just anger for the right reasons, but it's anger in the right way, in the right degree, and at the right time. So you can be right in being angry, but you can also be wrong in how you're angry. And that leads to sinful anger. What is sinful anger? Well, sinful anger is wrong anger expressed wrongly or right anger expressed wrongly. Robert Jones writes this. He says, the most frequent Old Testament term of anger denotes anger 47 times and at least 42 of them, 89% indicate sinful anger. Oftentimes we like to think better of ourselves, but God's word warns us about self-deception. Oftentimes we think our anger is righteous anger, but if we were to look at it, it's not righteous anger. Oftentimes it's sinful anger. It's either wrong anger expressed wrongly or right anger expressed wrongly. Rarely is it right anger expressed rightly. Well, how do you know? How do you know if it's a righteous anger or it's a sinful anger? Well, let's do an assessment together. Here are three questions. Maybe this is helpful for you. Number one is, am I reacting to actual sin or a personal inconvenience or preference? Is it an actual sin or is it an issue related to my own comfort? Is it a personal desire that I have that I now have as a demand for someone else? Is it a sin issue or is it a personal preference? Number two is this, is my anger about God's will not being done? Or is it really about my will not being done? Is it about God being dishonored or do I feel dishonored? Is it God that's offended or am I offended? And then the third question is this, is my anger express itself in godly ways? Is my anger in control or is my anger out of control? Does my anger rage? Does my anger scream? Does my anger curse? Does my anger... Um, uh, threatened? Does my anger intimidate? 
Does my anger lead to self-pity and despair and withdraw? Is my anger expressed wrongly, sinfully? So if you think about this assessment, the first two questions are, is my anger right? But then the third question is, is it expressed rightly? In order for us to have a righteous anger, it needs to be a right anger and it needs to be expressed rightly. Like I said, all throughout the Proverbs, there's a lot of Proverbs about anger. Let's look at another one. Second one is this, Proverbs 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife. A person of wrath is going to stir up strife. Well, what is wrath? Wrath is a form of anger. Wrath is uh, seeking vengeance for an unresolved issue. So if you have an unresolved hurt, if you have an unresolved conflict, you're going to create strife, you're going to create tension, uh, you're going to create an argument wherever you go. Uh, perhaps you've experienced the wrath of someone else and you're an innocent party in the midst of it, but you're experiencing the wrath. Why? Because people of wrath, it's like it hardens in someone's heart like concrete. It squeezes out the joy. Someone with wrath is a miserable person and a miserable person to be around. And so if you have unresolved issues in your life, you need to understand this, that your lack of emotional health is impacting the emotional health of those that are around you. And that's what this proverb says, a man of wrath or a person of wrath stirs up strife. But then it goes on to say that one given to anger causes much transgression. Well, what's transgression? Transgression is just another word for sin. So in our anger, we sin. We sin in our actions. We sin in our reactions. We sin in our interactions with other people. Uh, we sin with a red hot temper that's very volatile. But we also sin with an ice cold anger that's vindictive. Proverbs talks about this. Proverbs 15, 18, it says, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. This is what we most commonly think of as it relates to anger, that red-hot anger. But notice what Hebrews 12 says. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled, a root of bitterness. And so anger isn't always red hot. Sometimes anger is ice cold. Maybe this chart can help you think about this. Red hot anger blows up. Ice cold anger clams up. Red hot anger rages and rants. And ice cold anger simmers and stews. A red hot anger is revealed. It's obvious to other people. But oftentimes that ice cold anger is concealed inside, but it's simmering and stewing inside. Red hot anger is really aggressive. But the ice cold anger is passive aggressive. The red hot anger has a temper. Ice cold anger is bitter. Red hot anger is volatile. It's explosive where the ice cold anger is vindictive. As you look at this chart, where would you land, left or right? Red hot anger or an ice cold anger? Most of us have a tendency one to another. It's easy to see the anger in other people, right? It's easy to see the anger in your parents towards you when you were growing up or your anger towards your parents towards each other or anger that your spouse has or that your kids have or your friends have, but what about you? Can you be honest with yourself? Can you allow God's word to be a mirror into your life today? Where is it that you would land as it relates to this? Remember, we're talking about emotional strength. Emotional strength comes from controlling our anger. 
We're either controlled by our anger or we control our anger. Well, how do we go about controlling our anger? I feel convicted about my anger. What do I do? Here, let me share hopefully three things that are encouraging to us, three action steps that we all can take. The first thing is that we need to do is we need to own it. We need to confess our anger before God. And then we need to take that second step and we need to apologize to the people that we've hurt. When I said this, when I did this, be specific. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? That's what it means to own it. It first starts with owning it. The second thing is you need to deal with it. What do I mean by that? Well, you need to get to the root of your anger. Most anger in the present relates to unresolved issues in the past. Did you get that? Most of your anger in the present is connected to unresolved issues in the past. And so you need to deal with the issues that are in your past. Some of those emotional things, maybe you need to get around some other people that can help you sort that through. Find a wise friend, go see a Christian counselor, join me at Hope Group. But you need to deal with your anger. Third thing is this is that you need to replace your anger. What do I mean by that? It's asking God, God, help me take away my anger and replace it with gentleness. Replace it with patience. Replace it with grace. If you were with us a few weeks ago, Proverbs 15, one says this, that a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word, what? Stirs up anger. That a harsh word, it raises volume. It raises the tension. It raises the emotion. It raises the argument. But a soft answer lowers the tension, lowers the emotion, lowers the volume, lowers the argument. So ask God to replace that harsh word that leads to anger with gentle words that avoid the wrath. So that's anger. A lot more to be said about that, but we need to move on. We need to move on to the second emotion today. You tracking with me? Here's the second emotion. The second action is this is that emotional strength comes when I confront my anxiety. When I confront my anxiety. We're going to see this in a couple of Proverbs. First, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. If you're with us a few weeks ago, we talked about the second part of this verse. So let's focus on the first part. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Much like a heavy backpack weighs someone down physically, anxiety weighs us down emotionally. If you don't deal with your anxiety, it's going to lead to discouragement. And discouragement is going to lead to depression. And depression, if it's not dealt with, is going to lead to despair and to despondency. So as we talk about anxiety now, there's obviously lots of different levels. There's lots of different types of anxiety. There's generalized anxiety. That's a real issue. There is separation anxiety. There's social anxieties. There's PTSD. There's OCD. There's lots of different kinds of anxiety. Some people have some chemical imbalance where medication is needed to help with all of that. If so, see your medical doctor, talk to a mental health professional. I want you to know this though, that you are not alone and that there is nothing wrong with you. And so God's word, it talks about anxiety. So anxiety isn't just an emotional issue, but there's a spiritual aspect to it as well. In fact, God's word addresses fear, worry, and anxiety. Chances are you've heard those three words before. They're very similar, but they're different in some ways. Well, what is fear? Fear is uh, being afraid of something. 
A fear is usually a situational fear. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of water. I'm afraid of closed spaces. It's usually a situational fear. Well, what's worry? Worry isn't being afraid of something, but it's being worried about something. Worry tends to be very much more general than it is specific. Worry is usually thinking the worst about something that can happen maybe sometime in the future and getting stuck in that worry zone. Then what's anxiety? Anxiety is when fear and we're, uh, being worry, we're, worry gets stuck in your head like a one loop roller coaster that keeps going over and over and over again or a song that's on repeat and doesn't stop. It's the negative thinking that's going on, the soundtrack that's going on in our minds. And so if you're here today and you struggle with fear or worry or anxiety, I want you to know that you're not alone. All throughout God's word, we see characters in the Bible that struggled with these things too. Adam and Eve. Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Saul, Peter, and more. I read a statistic recently from 2018 that says this or revealed this, that eight out of 10 churchgoers, so that would be us, eight out of 10 churchgoers identify with either moderate to severe levels of fear. So think about that. That was in 2018. That was pre-COVID. Chances are it's higher today. But if that statistic is correct, if you're sitting in a row of 10 people, eight out of 10 people identify with moderate to severe levels of fear, myself included. And so what do you do? Well, first you need to locate your fear. Locate your fear that's causing the anxiety Uh, We can see uh, this on the chart. Common fears that produce anxiety. The fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of commitment. A fear of loneliness, the fear of getting caught, the fear of financial loss. The fear of death, the fear of illness, the fear of change, the fear of uncertainty, fear of abandonment, fear of something bad happening sometime. Fear of being judged, fear of getting hurt, fear of losing control, the fear of love, the fear of loss fill in the blank, the fear of. These are common fears that produce anxiety. So like I said, I struggle with fear, with worry, with anxiety myself. I can think back to two really specific seasons in my adult life where I went through some traumatic experiences in my life where I had panic attacks, I had shortness of breath, I had an irregular heartbeat, I had irrational thoughts going on in my mind. I've experienced that anxiety isn't just something that's mental and something that's emotional, but anxiety can be very much physical. But if I think back to those seasons in my life, this was the cycle that I was in is that I wanted control, but I didn't have control. And so I was fearful. And because I was fearful, I wanted control, but I didn't have control. And so I worried. And because I was worrying, I wanted control and I didn't have control. And so I had anxious thoughts. I was stuck in anxiety. It's a cycle. Can you identify with this cycle. And so where do you begin to break this cycle? I want control, I lack control, I'm fearful. Where do you begin to break the cycle? You need to break the cycle in your mind. You see, you have to understand this is that thoughts influence our emotions, our emotions influence our behavior. And so if you wanna get to the root of it, you gotta get to your mind. And this is why Proverbs 23, 7, it says this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you have anxious thoughts, you're going to be an anxious person 
And so again, you got to get back to dealing with it in your mind. That's where the battle is. And this is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So let's think about this, that fear, worry, anxiety, they're arguments and they're raised up against, they're competing with, they're conflicting with, they're contradicting what we know to be true about God in his word. And so what do we need to do with these thoughts that are fear, worry, anxiety? We need to take them captive to make them obey Christ, to bring them into alignment to what we know to be true about God in his word. So what I'm talking about here is possible not just from a spiritual standpoint, but from a neurological standpoint. This is where science backs up scripture is that you can recircuit your brain by the things that you think about, by the things that you dwell on. And that's why we need to know God's word, fill our minds with God's word. And so then when we are able to know God's word, we can identify the emotion and we can insert the truth. So let's play this out just in a couple of examples, even with some of these emotions that we're talking about here. How do I identify the emotion? Identify the emotion of fear. Well, what does God's word have to say? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So if you have prolonged paralyzing fear, you need to know this. Prolonged paralyzing fear is not from God that you don't need to fear circumstances, you have power. You don't need to fear people, you have love. You don't need to fear irrationally because God has given you a sound mind. Identify the emotion and then insert the truth. The next is identify worry. You begin to worry. I'm identifying that I'm worrying. What does God's word have to say? Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Why do we spend time worrying about things that are gonna, might happen tomorrow that are likely not ever going to happen? And so we spend our present time We give mental space. We waste our emotional energy. I'm worrying about something in the future that likely isn't going to happen. So identify the emotion, insert the truth. Identify anxiety. What does God's word have to say? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what does this mean? That when you begin to feel anxiety, when you begin to feel anxious, ask God to help to guard or to protect or to fortify your heart and your mind and to replace it with the peace of God. You see, when we are able to identify our emotion, we can insert the truth of God's word. This is why we need to be anchored in wisdom from God as it relates to our emotions. Before we move on to the third emotion, if you have uh, If you have found this uh, message to be helpful, these topics to be helpful, or if you're here and you want to help others as it relates to these topics, I encourage you to join me at Hope Group. You can text HOPE to the number you see on the screen, and we can get you more information about this. Over 100 people experienced HOPE through Hope Group uh, last year, and we would love to see even more people do that this year. Maybe you need to come as a participant or maybe you can sign up to be an apprentice leader and go through some training as it relates uh, to these topics. The reality is we all suffer in many ways. We suffer emotionally, we suffer relationally, we suffer physically, we suffer spiritually. Our struggles might be different. Your struggle might be different than mine. Our struggles might be different, but our struggle is the same. 
If you want to learn more about Hope Group, again, text HOPE to the number you see on the screen and we can get you more information about Hope Group. So let's look at our third emotion. We're diving in deep today. Are we tracking? So we were talking about anger. We talked about anxiety. Now let's get to our third action as it relates to joy. Emotional strength comes when I choose joy. So we'll look at two uh, Proverbs together. First, Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. That joy is good medicine and you don't even need to go to Walgreens to get it. That joy is good for your physical health. That's what this verse is saying. But it's also good for your emotional health. It's good for your relational health. Joy is good for your spiritual health. But joy is not happiness. I think you understand that. Maybe this chart can help you think about that. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is an attitude. Happiness is external. Joy is internal. Happiness is temporary. Joy is consistent. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy is contentness no matter the circumstance. And happiness is rooted in self where joy is rooted in the Lord. That the endless pursuit of happiness is always exhausting and leads to emptiness. But if you choose joy, then you can experience emotional strength. Let's look at another verse as it relates to joy in the book of Proverbs. The hope of righteous, of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. So the hope of the righteous, who are the righteous? We are the righteous. We may not act righteously, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that we have been imputed with his righteousness. And so the righteous are us. And it says this, that the hope of the righteous brings joy. Well, what is our hope? I hope that you understand that the word, the biblical word for hope is different from our common everyday language, English language word of hope. Everyday English language hope is more wishful thinking. It's about possibilities and probabilities. It's, I hope it doesn't rain today, or I hope that the Cubs win another World Series in my lifetime, or I hope that I win the lottery sometime. It's wishful thinking, and biblical hope is the opposite of wishful thinking. Biblical hope is confidence, it's assurance, it's certainty. Biblical hope believes that God's plans, that his purposes and his promises will always prevail. And because of that, because of that, we can have hope. And so those with emotional strength, they choose joy. We choose joy by choosing Jesus. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples just hours before he was crucified, Jesus said to them in John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy, his joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. These same words are true for each and every one of us here today. That God doesn't want us to have just some joy on some days, but when we have his joy in us, then we are full of joy. And so joy comes through a personal relationship with Jesus. It comes through choosing Jesus. Have you made that choice? It's not a choice that your parents or your grandma or your spouse or your friend or your pastor can make for you. It's a personal choice. Have you made that personal choice to place your faith in Jesus Christ? This brings us to communion. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, communion is an opportunity for us to reflect on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. To reflect on what Christ did in order that we might experience forgiveness, that we might experience life, that we might experience joy. 
There are two elements in communion. There's the bread and the cup. The bread symbolizes Christ's body broken for us. The cup is his blood shed for us. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what communion is about. But maybe you're here today and you're not sure that you're a follower of Jesus Christ or that you know that you're not. Today, today could be the day of salvation for you. Begins with just simply saying, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died and he rose again for me. I choose as best as I know how to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And if that's the desire of your heart, and you express those things to the Lord, it says that the angels are rejoicing even over one sinner who repents. So communion is an opportunity for us to remember Jesus Christ. In a moment, the worship team is going to sing a song over us. We're not in a rush, let them sing, but at the right time you can stand and you come to the front or to the back to one of our communion stations and you can take the elements, take them back to your seat. And then as you hold the elements at your seat, I'd encourage you to reflect back on this message today. Maybe you need to confess some anger to God. Maybe you need to confess some anxiety that you have in your heart and talk to him about that. He wants to hear from you. And ask God to replace your anger, replace your anxiety. Ask him to replace it with his joy. And then you can take the bread. And you can take the cup. And so let's respond to the Lord through communion.